So um, the we're going to treat kind of the same way as we did for special relativity. But again, now the, the basic idea is that special relativity dealt only with motions at extremely high velocities, or, or only become became necessary to deal with there. General relativity is the way to describe gravitational fields. And two key predictions here. Number one, let's say you have a planet or a sun or any massive body, like astronomically massive, not just like a clump of dirt. The gravitational field that this planet creates, so the gravitational field that this planet creates causes time to run more slowly. So specifically, a person standing here on the planet's surface is going to experience a slower clock relative to a satellite passing by because it's further away from the gravitational field. So number one, prediction number one, is that gravitational fields cause, or, or a stronger gravitational field, I should say, causes time to run more slowly. And specifically, we call this gravitational time dilation. N. So not only does it uh, go more slowly in strong gravitational fields, but that's also true for highly accelerating frames. And that's specifically because of the equivalence principle. That's the important point. That whatever is true of gravitational fields also has to be true of accelerating frames without gravity. And again, the, the way you actually kind of prove this is you treat an accelerating reference frame as um, integrating progressively higher factors of gamma, which do result, in fact, in um, uh, the same effects as special relativity, except when applied in non-inertial frames. So the second prediction here is of... Um, so going back, I mean, each of these are derived, again, from their special relativistic kind of variant. But this is how mass or acceleration affects space, uh, sorry, affects time. And so you can guess what the next one is. How does mass or, or equivalently accelerating reference frames, how does that affect space? This was time, here's space. And the short answer, as you guys maybe already know, is that gravitational fields also affect not the length of space necessarily, but the geometry of space. So it doesn't just, if you have like a massive body in the universe, it doesn't just contract, for example, the X component of, of a space-time grid. That doesn't make sense. It affects all the space-time dimensions equally, all the spatial dimensions equally. And the word that we use, instead of contracting those, we say, we say it warps space-time. It, and it does so in a very predictable manner. So I'll try to draw that up here. And when I say they warp space-time, we actually the warping of the time component is actually included in this effect here. So I'm really only referring to the warping of the spatial components. And the best way to visualize this, if you haven't seen it before, is the following. If you, well, let's, yeah, let me do this over here. Um, you can imagine that the, 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 the fabric of space is kind of like the, a sheet of a drum. And, you know, it's, it's tightened to a very, you know, high tension throughout the entire surface. And then if you take like, you know, a, a maybe a little small, like a bocce ball, like a, a small, fairly dense ball, place it on the surface of that uh, drum head. So you have something like this. You place a small lead weight or whatever on it, and it deflects that, that whole surface of the drum down just a little bit kind of uniformly in all directions. So I'm trying to draw, you know, just a slightly warping, otherwise flat surface. Now, in this case, the, the this, at least the one dimension that we have here that goes downwards like this, mathematically speaking, this analogy works great for that one dimension. So we have a two dimensional surface and we're warping it into a third dimension. Now, it, it, it's great to be able to think about it like that, but recognize, though, that the universe does this to three dimensions all at once. 
it warps the, the three spatial dimensions all together, and that's why we say it affects the geometry of space. So when you, when you stretch or pull a three-dimensional thing, you're affecting its geometry, and that's exactly what's happening. But there's no possible way for us to draw curved 3D space because, as you might guess, we would need a fourth dimension to really perceive that curvature. So that's what happens if we take a low mass object. Now, if we replace that small bocce ball with like, you know, a big bowling ball, what ends up happening now is we experience a much higher curvature. So here's that bowling ball like that. So there's a much greater curvature. And this is where kind of the fun comes in. So I'm going to redraw this picture a little bit bigger. Uh, it's not bad. Okay, so I'm trying to kind of draw this in like a 3D, like almost like a funnel. And this is a really cool effect now. So this, when, when we view, um, let's see, let, let me think for a second. So this causes two predictions. And now if we, if we imagine a slightly less, you know, severe case here, so I'll, I'll draw, I'll draw the same thing above, but with just a little bit of curvature. So just imagine that case of the, the marble or the small weight or something. Now, the first prediction here, if you take, let's say, you know, you had that, that weight at the center, you take a little marble. Now, I, I usually do this in class with actually like a, a real like image on the board here, uh, not my own hand drawn. But if you take a marble and you flick it, you know, if you're not going head on with that weight that's at the center of the drum there, if you kind of flick at an angle, clearly what happens is you have, you basically just kind of swerve around and, and, and you just kind of, you know, you deflect a little bit. Drawing that from above, actually that's a better way to see it here. Um, from above. So we'll draw it like this. Circle. And then here's that steel weight. Now, in this case, if we have a small marble and we flick it, let's say we start off going like this. Because the, the whole sheet is curved down like that or it's warped towards the center, what's simply going to happen is this deflects. Now, this is just a, you know, simply taking a physical analogy and kind of making a reasonable prediction from it, but it turns out that this is actually exactly what happens in the universe. This could indicate the sun, and here, let's, I'm just going to get rid of that entirely. Um, just imagine all the spaces curve inwards. This could indi indicate the sun, and this could indicate the path of an uh, incoming comet. So a comet that, what, for whatever reason, it had uh, orbital instability, and it accidentally slung shot into the center of the solar system. Unless it's on a direct collision course, it's going to gradually deflect left as it passes nearby the sun. Now, Newton said that. So Newton said that it feels a gravitational for a force to the left. So that's how Newton described why, or, or why objects seem to have their trajectories deflected nearby massive objects, because there is some invisible force of gravity that somehow or another transmits information from the sun to that passing comet that says, hey, veer this way, veer this way. He, he knew that there was a gap in his theory. He could mathematically predict exactly how that conversation would go, but he didn't think that conversation actually happened. He didn't know how that information was actually transmitted. And the weirdest thing about it is that it's as if, in, in order for his theory to work, that information has to be transmitted at instantly, at the speed of light, or sorry, at not, not at the speed of light. It has to be transmitted instantaneously from point A to point B. And that seems to disagree with how things work in the universe. So that's how Newton described it, though. The way that Einstein now changed this view is that he got rid of the idea of a gravitational force in the first place. He said gravity isn't actually a thing. What he said is, number one, so here's Einstein's view. 
Number one, massive objects, massive objects warp space-time inwards towards them. So this is kind of the, the cause. Instead of exerting a gravitational force, the sun simply just tells space nearby it to curve. Or, or more accurately, it, it's, space has no, no choice but to curve in the presence of a strong, massive body. So the sun warps the space-time inwards in a direction towards it. And number two, other moving bodies naturally follow the straightest path or the most direct path they can. But just like in this example here of a, of a deflected you know, 2D surface, when you curve space, what we think of as a direct path when we view it from further out is a globally curving path. So th th that's, that's a little bit confusing, but the idea though is that by following what, what appears to be a straight path in curved space-time, you're actually following a curved path. So moving bodies follow the direction of curvature of space-time. And that's what we perceive as the deflected trajectory. So this is kind of that first prediction here then that um, the warping of space-time is actually physically what's causing trajectories to be deflected not some invisible gravitational force that seemed to work at the, you know, at infinite speeds even. And then this is the fun one here, I think. Part B, imagine that we take that same marble here, but we have a much more strongly curved space-time. And now imagine, so this is kind of like, you know, if you guys remember like that um, at supermarkets, I don't know if they still have them, but like the big huge funnels that you take a quarter and you slide it tangentially at the top, and it very gradually, so if you, if you tap it just right, it goes around at almost a perfect radius, but because there is a slight dissipation of energy, a little bit of friction, um, maybe a tiny amount of air resistance, because in that case there's a slight deflection of energy, it will gradually spiral into the center. Now, of course, in, in actually the vacuum of space, there is no dissipative energy there, unless you're passing through like a gas cloud, but in the vacuum of space, you can imagine a planet coming by here, and it encounters a region of curved space-time, and at this point, it does its best to follow a straight path, but we now know that instead, due to the curvature of space, it's just going to start basically going side-hill. And now what it does, it keeps on going side-hill, keeps on going side-hill, and it, it, in a, if it has a specific range of energies, not too much, not too little, it will make a nice, perfect orbit here it will just keep on turning sideways as if it's always going on the side of a hill. And that's exactly how Einstein viewed orbits. So it predicts deflections, and it predicts, in fact, orbits, under, again, certain energy constraints, which is further than I want to go with this. And the one thing, by the way, that's important to mention here, I, I intentionally kind of avoided it, um, one of the ways that we, in fact, tested general relativity um, because, you know, we can't really test, we can't, we can't experiment to see whether there's an invisible force or not. They both have similar predictions that the gravitational influence will cause a force bending the planet left, or it will cause a space-time curvature, but the, the effect is the same, it still bends. The biggest difference, though, is that Einstein said that it's an effect of space-time itself. It's not due to the nature of the object passing through. And do you see where I'm going with this? For normal Newtonian mechanics, what must you have to have a gravitational force? A mass, which we already know we have, and a mass. Newton said gravity only works if you have two masses. But now viewing this much more geometrically, Einstein said that this is an effect of space-time itself. And anything passing through that space-time is naturally going to go, go along the same trajectories, light included. So specifically, Einstein's predict prediction was that light will also be deflected through curved space. And experimentally, we have, we have learned that to be true on my, time after time after time. The, the way that this is usually summed up, which I don't love this, but gravity bends light.
And by the way, the, um, the confirmation of general relativity was based on this effect, and specifically in, um, I, I'm going to get the date wrong, but I want to say that it was, I think Einstein, yeah, Einstein published his paper in 1927 on general relativity. So there was a 22-year gap there. But Einstein published in 27, in 1928, I believe, um, Sir Arthur Eddington, the, the famous uh, British astronomer, um, knew there was an eclipse going to be uh, happening in Central Europe that, that next summer, and specifically during that eclipse of the sun, he knew that there was a star that should be, a background star that should be directly behind our sun. In other words, we should not be able to see, <laughs> there, okay, we should not be able to see a background star during the eclipse because it's directly behind the sun to us. But what Eddington realized is that if Einstein is correct, the light from that star, even if the star is directly behind our sun, it will bend around our sun and we'll still be able to see it. Or viewed from above, instead of going like that, it will bend around and we can still see it during the eclipse. So he went and measured during the eclipse, and during totality, he saw that sun pop out just beside, or sorry, he saw that star pop out just beside the sun, where it otherwise should have been actually directly behind the sun. So that was experimental proof that we now have an observation that disagrees with Newton and agrees with Einstein. Therefore, it seems like Einstein must be the one who's correct. Um, as it turns out, by the way, um, the, the predictions about exactly where the location of that background star should have been were off in the first place. And so as it turns out, in theory, even if we'd seen that star, that would actually be consistent with what Newton said, because that star wasn't actually directly behind the sun anyway. But um, it's, it's correct. his theory is correct anyway. So. <laughs>